Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, before we start, I just wanted to, uh, to say that two days ago we received an email from um, Feras, and unfortunately he's stuck in Syria at the border with Turkey. He couldn't, he couldn't come. He says he sends his uh, apologies. Um, today we're talking about authenticity, authentic voices in storytelling. It's such a broad topic. Um, we're going to look particularly at character-led films, but um, also at what, what, what it means, what it means uh, to, to tell an authentic story. And I think what I would like to um, is, reg we're going to have questions at the end, but regardless of, you know, I just would, wouldn't like this to be a formatted discussion. So whenever you feel like you have a comment or a question, just please jump in. Um, and to start, um, I will just ask each of the panelists to, to just talk about what is the theme that, that they, they explore with, within their films? What, what are you trying to say with your films? And how much of you is in that story? Would you, whoever wants to, to start. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Leo. <laughs> Themes of my films. Yeah, what what are you trying to say with your films? Um, I think with my films, I'm trying to give a voice to people who are less, not voiceless, but preferably unheard, I'd say. Mm. And um, a lot, a lot of, not all, but a lot of the themes are around the the black community, and that's informed by my experiences, experiences of friends and family. And, you know, feeling almost, I've, I've never known another country, I was born here, I haven't travelled much, and feeling denied in, in my own home, and not, not seeing myself on the TV. So obviously it's, it, it's a, ma a majority white country, but it would be nice to see myself represented on the TV, to see people that look like my uncles, cousins, you know, aunts. And whilst you do see a lot of content like that, it's not, it feels like token gestures and it's not, um, it's not, it's not authentic. Yeah. Speaking of the title of the talk, it's not, it's not authentic and it doesn't speak to me. I'm not interested, to be honest, I'm not, I'm not interested. So I'd like to feel that I can create something that would, would um, fill a void. I think. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Do you? Well, um, um, I have to actually echo a lot of what you're saying. Um, I only started making films about six, seven years ago, and it was because of a very just deep sense of frustration with, with the lack of understanding around certain topics. Um, so whether it is topics surrounding the experiences of women of color or people who come from a variety of backgrounds, I just found that the stories that we are telling are very limited. The stories that we are telling are not experiences like you were just saying that I recognize myself in. And I just felt like because we're not having some of the conversations that we desperately need to have, distance is still growing, divides are still deepening, and fractures are still happening between our, our communities. And we were just saying this backstage, you know, when it comes to our kind of multicultural, our diverse societies, we should have been much farther along at this point than we really are. Um, and so the reason for me making films was to try and see if those gaps uh, of understanding and gaps of difference can be bridged through some of the stories that I wanted to tell. Um, so I would say very much the sort of types of themes that I address in my filmmaking has to do with our intercultural, our multicultural societies, both the beauty of it, but also the challenges um, and, and the difficulties that we still very much face. Um, and I think I've always um, prioritized trying to tell stories through character, almost regardless of the issue. Sometimes they're very, very um, 
sort of headline issues like the House of Lords or it can be a big news story, whatever it is, or it can be something nobody knows about. But fundamentally what I try to do is break through the us and them through character. Mm. So it's about recognising that a lot of television just reconfirms people's prejudices, I think, however hard you try. But if you can get an audience to engage on a human level and just like somebody, Mm -hmm. understand their problem, begin to see the round picture, then you can break through so much of people's prejudices or ignorance about people. So I think that that's sort of almost aggressively driven my work from the beginning. I mean, I think... Sorry. No, I was going to say, I think it's very interesting what you're saying because I think that's one of the things about documentary films that I really love is that it allows us those windows, those, those cracks, those possibilities of where we might recognize ourselves in the other, whoever the other yeah. might be. If it's a man, if it's from somebody, if it's a woman, if it's from someone from a different part of the world, different background, it creates those moments. And I think wherever those moments become possible, also change happens. Um, so I think it's the, the humanity, finding the humanity of each other somehow. Yeah. I think is what it's about for me. But the question is, though, whether there are some people whose humanity you shouldn't try and find. Mm. You know, there are certain films where you're trying to be cosy with a total shit and somebody who you know has done wrong, and there's your challenge. But isn't, but isn't that I did attempt... Tony Blair's party election broadcast. But isn't that attempt in itself interesting, though? Isn't that dynamic with that shit? I think it makes me feel deceitful. It I makes think you feel it, deceived. Yeah, because you use relationship and character and all those devices to make an audience like somebody, but actually it may not be right to like that person. Mm-hmm. Do you try to make your audience like people? Yeah, 100%. And you I do. don't film people unless I get on, even when I did Tony Blair's thing, and that was, you know, it was a commission, it wasn't a documentary, it was a party election broadcast, but we met... Um, and spent a few hours together, because unless there was any electricity, it wasn't going to happen, it wasn't going to work, and it wouldn't work with me and him. What followed was a joke, because obviously I was shooting observationally, but I was always outside the office, I was never allowed in. That was a hiccup. (laughs) (laughs) Slightly, yes. (laughs) That's very interesting, because we touched already on on relationship, and I think relationships in general, real, real relationships are authentic. Once you you uh, get to that point. There's a click mm. when, when, it, when that happens. So I would like to, us to have a look at the, the first clip. It's from um, Molly's film, since Molly, you, you mentioned uh, you're interested in humanity and character. Uh, Molly's last film uh, is called Being Blacker, and uh, it's about this uh, uh, guy called Blacker in Brixton. Um, I won't say more. I just want to, to us to have a look at this clip when I had my incident yeah when I was in the hospital oh, sorry that's not the one um, a lot of the nurses and other people in the ward was telling me that yeah. what had happened Tali, who yeah. can I just say I, I, can I contextualize the clip yeah Cause it's a bit odd if you haven't seen it which is just it's a 90 minute portrait of this Man, and the film begins with me saying, because he's a raster, I'm very middle class and white, and I am establishing at the beginning of the film for the audience that our, our relationship, because I have to, and he comes up and he sort of greets me. Then a funeral happens, which is about six minutes of screen time. Still, the audience don't quite know what the hell's going to happen. And very early on in the film, I'm trying to set a tone, I'm trying to cross. an amazing scene. I mean, it says so much, actually, about the, our subject, I think. Um, don't talk like me, talk like you. And then he says, I'm talking for your audience. Yeah. So I think this is a question for, for, all, of, for the, all of you. How much do you think when people have that already preconceived idea of what media wants from them when you, when you encounter them? A lot, I'd say. Massive. Mm. Increasingly. 
I mean, even back in 92, I did a long series in London Zoo, and London Zoo does a lot of television. So, and I'm just saying that because that was 400 years ago, and even then, I remember the elephant keeper talking to somebody of, I'm filming, I'm talking to him. Who the fuck is he talking to? He's talking to an imaginary interviewer. So I said, who are you talking to, Brian? He said, well, you know, I've got to talk off camera. And I said, no, 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 no. And so we had a sort of class where we discussed, you just, just talk to me. And so obviously it's my job to try and make that work, the eye contact with the camera. Now I think it's become bizarre because the whole world is on telly and everyone's filming everyone else and it never stops and it's very hard to know where the divide is, people are constantly being cheeky and fun when you're filming them. You've almost got to kind of strip it down and make them miserable and build it up again. <laughs> Not true with um, Naptali and Blacker. Very different, because they don't have respect for that culture. They're not sort of not part of it, so that was a different thing. But I'm just jumping in and answering, because I feel it strongly that people never stop larking about thinking that's what you want. Mm. So do you think you reach an authentic moment with your uh, subject when, when they stop, when they start talking like them? When, when they stop talking like someone that you think they want... They want I you think to an be... authentic moment is when the camp... When actually, when the, when the subject feels the confidence to take the power of the situation. Mm -hmm. And in this film, quite far down in the film, uh, we get serious. I'm not observing anymore. Blacker is being interviewed, and we're talking about... In fact, I ask him to sit somewhere because I say the light behind you makes you too dark. And then mm -hmm. he says, don't be racist. And we start talking <laughs> about colour, and he is absolutely in command of that whole interview. He is dictating it, he is telling me, and he's challenging me, hence the audience. And he's saying, you think diversity is going on, and diversity is a word. And I'm very proud of that, because um, I think that is authentic. A lot of observational shooting that I do, yes, it's authentic, but there's also a game going on. You're filming people who are good at performing their lives, and I think that's gone on forever, which is why you cast... I always cast a film very, very, very particularly... Any observational film should be cast with people who are able to perform. Interesting. I mean, my sort of recent experience was I spent most of last year with uh, white supremacists in, in America. Um, and what was interesting to me is that our initial encounters, you know, they, they're very much prepared on, on how they want to be perceived, what they want to talk about, why they're even spending time with me. And my job um, was to basically get past that, to get past their talking points and get past their kind of choreographed presentation of, of who they want to be viewed as. And, you know, the more time that we spent together, you know, we did get to who they are as people. And that's, that was really my intention, was to try and see if I could get to the, the human beings behind all this rhetoric and behind all the, um, the chest beating. Um, and we did, and that was very confusing. Uh, it was extremely confusing for them. Um, and what they kept saying is, we've never been spoken to like this before. We've never been spoken to as if we're actually people. So I think they knew how to, they would have known how to deal with somebody who just came in on the attack, who would just immediately start arguing um, and trying to pick apart their, their ideology rather than just speaking to them as human beings. Um, and so I found that really interesting how we were able to create a very unusual and, un and unexpected bond. I mean, you know, most of them hate Muslims. They've never met a Muslim until they met me, uh, but absolutely hate people like me because they've seen some video on, on Facebook mm -hmm. or because they've watched Fox News uh, or listened to their president for that matter. Um, so it was really interesting to, to, to break through their desire to control their image and their perception. Right. We're going to come back to that, uh, but I wanted to ask Leon, because it's, it's such a particular uh, subject. You worked with your... You made a film about your brother. So, you know, we're not talking subject or character. He's, he's your brother. Tell us um, a bit about... Um, how that? How is that different? How from? I mean, was there a moment when, you know, the fact that you pointed the camera at him and you're his brother? Did he change 
the way he behaves? Did you, did you feel like he <coughs> tried to perform some, someone else? I mean, well, I should explain. My, my film is about my, my little brother. Uh, last year he was stabbed in an unprovoked attack and he nearly died. And less than 24 hours after being taken to hospital, he was told by doctors, several nurses, that it was his fault because of how he dresses, because of the way he looks. He needs to stop carrying knives. He needs to stop hanging around in gangs. None of that is true of him. And I, I was originally planning to make a film in response to another documentary that I'd been on, which was just showing the, the usual stereotype of young black men. Some of it was... By, just by coincidence, filmed in, in my area. Some of the young men in it I actually knew. They came to speak to me. Said Basically, they felt powerless. They had no means of challenging it. And the way it was presented to them was completely different to what we saw on the TV. So that was my initial aim, was just to uh, respond to that. And then my brother was stabbed whilst I was trying to figure it all out. And, you know, it just came to me when, when the nurse said that and the doctors were saying that, well... I'm going to address that because this stereotype is so powerful that he's laying here, kind of, you know, he's just got out of danger and he still is being blamed. And so, I mean, in, in filming it, it, it wasn't... It wasn't the, the way you see him in, the, in the, the film, he's only ever that way with me. So what you see on camera is quite his normal interaction with me. And I'd say I'm something... You know, I'm 18 years older than him. I'm something mm. between an older brother and a dad to him. So he also feels, I mean, even amongst black people, there's still, you, you kind of can't, white people buy into this stereotype, but also black people buy into this stereotype and feel this is the way they have to be. And it's, it, it didn't make it into the final cut, but he actually says this. That, you know, there's there's a pressure to be this way, and if you're not this way, you get called a coconut and a sellout, mm -hmm. and why not? And I think, especially at that age, he was 17, when you're kind of just starting to find out who you are, there's a lot of, you'd need a certain, you know, quite a lot of strength to try and break away from the crowd and, and to be yourself, to listen to music that, you know, and not have uh, kind of uh, comments like, why are you listening to white music, like, why can't, why can't we just listen to what we don't want to listen to? So in, in the interaction with him, it's just, it's almost as if he only feels that he can speak in that way when he's talking to me. But if you observe him with his friends, he kind of morphs into, into the group and becomes one of them. Mm -hmm. So it was to kind of help him to get this point across and hopefully other young people will see how you know, see him speaking in this way and think, okay, it's okay for us to be to be this way. Uh, I had something else to say, I forgot. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, I got it, sorry. Um, the, the difficult thing about it was that just watching it and kind of reliving the moment and just remembering arriving at hospital, seeing him covered in blood and the emotions he felt and it, watching him relive it as I'm filming him and kind of part of me is wanting to just go to him and make him okay but then for the purposes of the film, I just have to keep, keep pushing. So part of it, he revisits the scene of where it happened. And he said he didn't want to go right to where, where he actually got stabbed. So I said, you know, that's, that's fair enough. But then he just started walking. Mm -hmm. And so I just followed him. And you can see he's kind of gradually, it's, it's, it's grinding him down. And then he, he's close to tears, but he's fighting it. And then, you know, that goes back to mm -hmm. masculinity. He mm -hmm. felt he almost feels like he can't cry. He, mm -hmm. he doesn't want to cry because men don't cry. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, uh, I think it would be great to watch now, actually, the clip from, uh, from the barbershop, from uh, Leon's film, please. To me, that's just uh, an, an amazing scene. I think it's just... Um, wonderful the intimacy there that you can definitely see I mean and also I just you know maybe I, I don't know I should admit I just never seen on TV or film I've never seen such uh, black hair being trimmed like that I actually have never seen that um, so it's um, do you want me to, to tell us a little bit more about uh, what happens in in the, the relationship between him and, and the barber and what happens in this space, oh, yeah. how, 
the you barber know, shop, me, I feel a lot, you know, on the, on the TV, the barber shop is often shown, um, I think one of the uh, stereotypical representations of black people is the, like comic relief. And the barber shop is a place of uh, comedy, I guess. And mm. obviously we, we do get a lot of jokes in there, but you know, <laughs> we get a lot of jokes in there, but above all of that is the a place it, it is a, like a, a, a sanctuary, I guess, and it, it's a, a, a community hub. And you go there, and I'd say, Stuart, the barber, he, he's been cutting my hair since I was 17. He doesn't anymore, but um, <laughs> he, I would say the, 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 you probably couldn't count the number of young men who have not done something that they were planning to do as a result of having a conversation either with the barber or someone else that they met in the shop. And I'd include myself as one of those young men. And it's a place where you don't have to... Because, I mean, I mean, a lot, a lot in, in life, I mean, everyone's struggling at the moment, but when, you, when you're a young, young black man, there's, it's almost like you're being attacked from all angles at all times. And then you, you step through the door into the barber shop, and it's like a place where you can take off your armor, and you can just unwind, and you get the haircut. It, it, the haircut is not just a haircut. It kind of it lifts your... Your, your self-esteem, you, you come out feeling, feeling fresh, you've got your new trim, you look sharp, and you've had you know, a, sort of, a sort of therapy, and, and you can share. I mean, one thing I've found is when, when speaking about my experiences in relation to being black, is that quite often uh, a white person will become defensive when I speak about it, or deny it and say, yeah, but, and that, that's quite hurtful to have, yeah, but, when you're talking about your personal life experiences, there's, there's, there's no yeah, but, there's, that's just what it is. And to go, to go into somewhere where you can talk about an experience and share that experience with other people who know what it's like, and it, it is literally like, you know, you say a, a problem shared, and it starts to take the weight off you, and you kind of are rejuvenated for... The, the next battle almost. <laughs> the next battle or to go and you know you've got a renewed fire to just get on with it and not not, not give up and not let it get the better of you mm. thank you for that um, Deja talking about battles I feel that with your films you often confront your, unfortunately we don't have a clip to show but you often um, confront your contributors or subjects um, to the point that you feel this is actually what created the the intimacy between between you and the character, and um, I'm talking, I'm thinking especially about that um, scene from um, when you so your film about the white right in in the U.S., where you interviewed uh, Jeff, I think his name was, mm -hmm. and you read you read he, your your text, the, the kind of messages, abusive messages that you received. Do you want to talk a bit about what happened in that scene and the kind of how you got him to open up? Well, so the, the, the f reason that I, I decided to make that film in the first place was that I, I did an interview on the BBC talking about diversity and the fact that we need to really be open and honest about the diverse society that we live in um, and, and that... What I said was that Britain's never going to be white again mm -hmm. and that we're going to have to build a future that includes all of us. And that clip uh, went viral and the amount of death threats that I got uh, was absolutely astonishing um, to the point where you know, police had to get involved and it got quite messy. But, so I decided that I wanted to go and try and meet people like that, people who feel that way, people who, and also feel so entitled to, to um, push towards violence in that way. So when I sat down, I mean, it was impossible initially for me to find anyone willing to actually sit down with somebody like me. You know, they feel very brave when they send you things, but to actually sit face to face with their enemy, with, with the person that they're calling all these various names and the person that they say they're going to rape and they're going to cut and, and all of this. 
Um, but finally, somebody agreed, and one of the men that agreed was Jeff Scoop, and he was the he is um, the leader of the largest neo-Nazi organization in America. And the very first, I mean, his condition was, we'll sit and we'll talk for one hour, that's all you get. And I said, okay, that's fine. And we sat and we actually talked for four or five hours. Um, and the scene that you're talking about, uh, you know, he was giving me the party line. He kept talking about, you know, how the white man is suffering in America, how white people are going to become a minority, and how this is sort of a last stand, and how white guys in particular are discriminated against because women are taking their jobs and people from various um, minority groups are taking their jobs and so on and so on. Um, but he had no reflection about you know, what his behavior and his ideology, what kind of impact that has on other people. So I pulled out all the messages that I get and I started reading him some of these things and I, started, and I said out loud you know, the fact that I'm called a sand nigger, the fact that I'm called a shit skin, that I'm, fact that I'm called all these various things. Um, and I kept reading it, and he, he started looking really uncomfortable, which I thought was really interesting. And I even said to him, I said, look, this is obviously not the first time you're hearing any of these words. Yes, but I don't use language like that. Okay, you don't use language like that, but you know, your fellow travelers do. Um, and why is this so uncomfortable? And, and, and he wouldn't really answer, and then I, I kept referring to myself as a shit skin. I kept referring to myself as the language that they use for somebody like me. And he got very uncomfortable and said, why do you keep saying that? And, and, and I was like, do you not like me saying it? Um, and he didn't. He didn't like me referring to me in that way. And I just, I just it was a very strange moment um, and really interesting. Um, and, and, you know, the thing is, I'm so used to being a Muslim woman, being a woman of color, you know, I'm so used to being stereotyped. I know exactly what that feels like. And my mission with this film was I refuse to stereotype other people, even if it's people that I dislike, even if it's people that I disagree with completely, like neo-Nazis, but I still refuse to reduce their humanity down to a caricature or a stereotype. So I tried very, very hard um, despite their best efforts, <laughs> to try and get to, to the human being as much as possible. And that moment for me, where he wasn't able to be his kind of full-fledged Nazi self in front of me, um, I just found that really telling and really interesting. Um, and so we ended up actually spending a lot of time together after that. I think it's really interesting that we, keep, we talk about authenticity, but we keep referring to identity and race, mm. um, but you also mentioned humanity. And um, in an interview, Molly, uh, I think you, you said that when you pitched your idea or a, a TV channel told you that this is a black subject and you're, you're a white woman, well, they, they almost told you you're not going to make this film. Um, that was the just, early days of Channel 4, because I right. made um, a really bad student film. It's when I met Blacker. I made a film about two big sound systems in South London, and Blacker was the selector for one of them, but it was an entirely musical film. It's literally about how you wind in the bass, the treble, etc., etc., and I really wanted to make a film about the rest of his life, and we took it to Channel 4, but Channel 4, it was early days, and she was very, very clear about it, the commissioning editor. She said, no, we cannot commission you to make a, subject, make a film about a black subject, I don't know whether that's right or wrong. What do you think? I mean, I thought at the time it was wrong, obviously. I've always thought it's wrong. Blacker certainly. Think. We've had, we've, I've had a problem with this this time, too. Mm. Um, but he and I are solid about it, so that stops any awkwardness. But I don't know whether... See, I'm not sure that that gives other people a chance. It's not as if somebody else then went ahead and made that film, because the problem is deeper than that. The problem is deeper than that. I mean, you know, mm. on the flip side of that also, I don't know how, how you feel about this, but, you know, for me, you know, I, I, I can't, it, it, or I can, but, you know, it wouldn't be easy for me to, say, make a film about the economy or about, you know, th th anorexia or, or, or something, you know, if, if, and if I did, I think, you know, commissioning editors would probably go, oh, okay, so will that be anorexia as it relates to Muslim women? or to brown people, or, you know, so, so you kind of get, so, so 
you know, you get ghettoized in, in sort of ways, which I think is really destructive. You know, who's allowed to tell what stories? You know, there are endless stories that need to be told, um, and someone should tell them. But I think one of the, the things that we're really struggling with is the diversity of people who have the capacity to tell those stories are not being allowed, are not being given a chance to tell those stories. Um, so I think it's, 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 a, it's a wide spectrum of Molly, you being told, well, you're a white woman, surely you can understand uh, a subject like this. And I'm sure you're told, and I'm certainly told, that I can only tell certain stories because then it will be authentically me. Uh, I can represent Muslim people, which I can't. I can only represent me and a very narrow experience of, you know, I, I am not all Muslim people. Yes. And it, sorry. Do you remember um, Dark as How? Brilliant, brilliant Dark as How. Mm -hmm. He made a series, anyone here see it, called The White Tribe, yeah. which was so... It, what for me that the extraordinary thing was how shocked I was as to how I felt watching it, which is I thought, whoa, this is a real wake up call, because he just he because he was saying what he felt about how lost English people were. We had no culture, we didn't know where we were, and it's a series where he goes out to find an, a white English person who actually knows who they are, where they're from, and what they're about, mm -hmm. and it was brilliant. Mm -hmm. But you so. In that view, you as an outsider made this film about the, the, the Jamaican community in, in Brixton, right? But it, your relationship with Black Eye, it feels so intimate. It's almost like, you know, he does, he calls you Miss Smalley. But it isn't but about the wider community in Brixton. It really isn't. It's his story. Right. And his, I like to go tiny to try and say bigger things. I'm not ambitious. I can't be ambitious. So I am not doing... <clears throat> wide shot of South London at all, at all. Mm. That's his base, and all I was trying to do was to put an audience of all sorts in his mind, in his head, in his life, to try and feel, because he's had a son that's shot, he's had his last child, mm. goes to school in Jamaica, because that child was also excluded from mainstream school here. So I'm not sort of banging on or making points, I just want an audience to see the pain of that, just to see how he feels about that. I'm only jumping in saying that because people often think, oh, you know, it's about South London, it's, but it's just not. Mm. It's about colour, his life experience, the last 30 years of neglect of that community mm. at a very high level in this country, um, and how he's dealt with it. So that's mm. what I'm trying to do, is by being very up close with him and having, as it were, a conversation. Yes, and I think that up-close relationship <coughs> is something that... Um, dictates, in a way, how authentic maybe a character-driven story is. Um, and mm. time is key, isn't it? Um, the time you spend uh, making the film, and it's often quite a luxury, I think, to have that time nowadays when you make a documentary. I mean, you, you've been filming on and off with, with Blacker for two years, and then you've known him for 20 no. years, but no? No, I first met him when we were 19, we're both nearly 60. But we've okay. met each other three or four times during that period. Right. But we've really spent a lot of time together from 2014 when his mother died. But he went to prison for 19 months. Yes. So when they say this film took three years, it's because he was away for 19 months. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, But I think the... Um, sorry, I've lost my drift. Uh, time. Yeah. We're talking about the question of time, how much time mm. you spent, if it... Well, that's why I cut back. My money doesn't go on crew. It goes, I shoot, and now I record, which is a bit depressing. I say stick a radio mic on somebody. but then And it means you're quite lazy filmically, I think, because it is just you and that person. On the other hand, it means you can go so much deeper into someone's lives. You're so much less in the way. And in terms of me hanging around on the streets outside Blacker's shop or going into situations that are... 100% black. A lot of his life is absolutely not integrated at all. We were talking about this before. Um, and I... Because I thought this conversation was going to be about that sort of thing. Because actually, I think that he was a totally a gatekeeper. I couldn't have made this film at all without Blacker's friendship and certainty and him literally taking me in and opening the door. And when he wasn't there, it wasn't going to happen. Um, also, in terms of um, 
style, and probably this is going to be the last question, and in terms of narrative, um, there's always that um, discourse of the cinema verite that you can only make, a, that what is real is with pure observational, hands-off, no voiceover. Um, and I think both you, Molly, and uh, Dea, you, you both, you have your films authored. They are driven by vo voiceover. Was that uh, a conscious choice? Was, was it um, because it's so much of you in, in that film? Is it, is it also about you? Several of the films joy. that I've done have, have been about the relationship between me and the people that I film. Um, oh, somebody would like to ask something. Yes, of course. Please. Yes, I, I have a question there. Um, when you met, you, you met white supremacists, but yeah. where did you take it from there? Um, I'm from East Germany, and there is a, a lot of unrest in, in the Golden East, and a lot of it has to do with people feeling extremely threatened. Yeah. And, and there's very few films that actually talk to the people who, you know, uh, are neo-Nazis, effectively. Um, and it's, own, it's not limited to that area, but um, it's a focal point. So, so there are very few films, but the ones that, that do speak to those people... Um, that's somehow where it ends. The, the, the dialogue that starts never continues. So what was your... Is, is there some sort of ongoing relationship that you have with those people? Or where do we take it from there? For, for, for me personally, I, I don't know how other filmmakers do, but for me personally, I do have an ongoing relationship with most of the people that I film in any film, and, and also in particular this film. Um, the, the film, I mean, I can just tell you, but I actually ended up becoming friends with some of them, which feels incredibly awkward for me to sit here and say I became friends with neo-Nazis. But two of them, one of them left the movement while I was still filming, um, partly as a result of coming in contact with me. It's nothing I did. Has nothing, it's not me doing anything great or being special. The only thing that was special was he'd never come into contact. There, he had never encountered the other. He'd never encountered his enemy before. And when he did, he realized that, you know, I don't have horns, I'm not evil, I'm not, you know, out to destroy him, that I'm just a person. Um, and it was very hard for him because we talked about deportations. You know, he kept talking about deporting people like me. And when I asked him, you know, would you do that to me, he found he just, just, just everything, just, it just didn't sit right in his mind anymore. So he left. One of the other young men that I filmed with um, called me a few weeks ago. And he's left the ideology and the movement and absolutely every single thing behind. And one of the things that he said was important to him is not just that we sat and we talked to each other like human beings uh, with respect, not for each other's ideas, but for each other's humanity. Um, he felt like I didn't give up on him, even though he did and said very ugly things. He, even in the film, said, you know, I consider you to be a friend. Um, and that word friendship is something that then subsequently made him leave. So he's gone through all kinds of other stuff now. Leaving movements like that is extraordinarily difficult for a lot of these men because their entire universe is invested in that group. Um, so he's now standing completely alone, completely isolated, and actually at, 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 a, lot of, at a lot of risk to himself. And so he has no one. He has no friends. So I'm trying to honor that word friend that he has called me and trying to be there for him as he's going through this process and trying to introduce him to other people who have also left the movement in the past who might be able to fill that void uh, of, of the lack of community that he now finds himself in. Um, so where do we take it after doing something or, or speaking to people like that is I, I personally think self-righteousness and, and just hating them and just just writing them off and giving up on them, I, th I personally think is a mistake. I think we have to hang in there because what I found, you know, I, I've done this film, I've also done a film with jihadis and I found a lot of similarities between both groups of men and, and I think a lot of the reasons why men like that join these groups actually 
actually has less to do with the ideology and more to do with a lot of human needs that, and emotional needs that are not being met elsewhere. And to me, as a society, those are the factors that we can do something about and that we have a responsibility to do something about. Just hating them and shunning them and locking them up and banning them doesn't make those feelings and those opinions go away. So I believe we have to engage with people that we dislike, disagree with, because there is always the possibility for some kind of transformation. There's always hope there. That's at least what I found both with the jihadis and also with the, with, the, with the neo-Nazis. So my personal philosophy is you don't give up on people even if they've given up on themselves, um, which doesn't mean you apologize for what they're doing. You're not trying to normalize their, their views. Or, you know, I'm not saying let's all go and hug a Nazi. I'm not saying that. Um, but I also think punching a Nazi is not necessarily the way to go either. Um, you know, again, we're, we're, we have to find a way to make our, our society work. We have to try and make our differences. We have to try and coexist even though we have all these differences. And the only way we do that is we have to speak. And we were saying this earlier, you know, film to me is one of these incredible um, spaces, these tools, these instruments where we can try and open up some of those really uncomfortable, ugly conversations, but that we need to have. Thank you. This is a question for Molly. Um, in being blacker, there was a mo that moment that you talked about where he discusses diversity and he's against the backlight and you, you tell him to move. There was, um, I was involved in some groups online and there was a moment within that in which um, I think you cut away to a fly, which became a, which became a talking point. Um, alongside, you know, the, there's a kind of the, the the showing of the dead black body at the beginning of the film as well. So there was a, there was a few moments in the film that became quite critical talking points in some groups that I'm that that I, I was part of online. So what what I'd like to ask you, I suppose, is how far do you go to ensure that you are aware of the stereotypes that you might be perpetrating, or you know, how how, how do you ensure that you're kind of accurately depicting that? The, the, what that person represents in a wider form, you know. So you said that being, being, you said Blacker was sort of, it wasn't a film about South London, but he is South, you know, he represents South London. So there's a lot of things that... Well, not particularly, because the whole of South London hasn't had his rackety past, or indeed his noble past. Mm. I mean, it, the fly cutaway, it's funny. Well, were people cross about the fly? Well, the fly moment is actually, it's not to do with that. There's a very long interview yeah. with Natali. And he's looking into the camera. It's a nightmare as a filmmaker yeah. because it's, it's one long take. There is nothing to cut away to. And I didn't want to do jump cuts as a sort of because I'm trying not to be, make people aware of process. I'm trying to put people in his life. And there was absolutely nothing. And I don't know why I filmed that fly. And you know what? He then killed the fly. And what I really wanted to do was have the fly then have him go whack. But because of the nature of the interview... And the nature of Natali and his past, I could not have him killing the fly. And the fly remained, and it was almost there sort of because there was a jump cut. And it's really awful, because I know there were certain things people looked, took a lot in that fly. And I don't, I don't know what they've taken from the fly. But um, it, it, it goes back to what I'm saying, really. I think it's, it, it feels as though, it, for the black community or people watching that, they saw it as something that amplified a sense of, Poverty, you know, and... Um, what, a fly? A flying well, ant means well, poverty. It, it sounds very sort of... You know, I think, nuanced, no, I think what exactly that what is, is that's probably exactly what we're here to discuss. Exactly. That's probably resentment that you are telling a black story and therefore that is stereotypical and you don't know what you're talking about. Mm. And that's why I'm saying the fly is a tricky one because the fly is really a sort of bit of a filmmaking hiccup and me thinking, yeah. what the hell? And we even bothered to backtrack a buzz to anticipate the fly cutaway in the dub. That's how the fly was. What was the other one you mentioned? Well, I, I, I it was the, at the beginning where the, the, the six-minute scene... Oh, with his mother, with yes. His mother. And whilst that I, I'm not sure about that, but I think that that's, again, I don't think that's to do with being um, knowledgeable about a community. I think... I had a, a real moral issue with that at all, which is Blacker's mother. In the um, funeral, she's, well, she's open. It's an open coffin, 
And he's asked me to film at The Undertaker's the night before, and then he wants me to film her in the church in the open coffin. Now, obviously, for a wider audience, that's a shock. Is it crossing a boundary? Is it disrespectful? And yet, within his world, it's absolutely not disrespectful, nor is it intimate. It's very, well, you know, it's very public. And I still haven't quite understood why. I'm not sure that... Because I go to so many funerals with him, and I always feel incredibly intrusive going past the open coffin. So that's, you know, a very genuine subject for debate. I'm not sure whether it was right or wrong, but it's there because I wanted the intimacy of that family saying goodbye to their mother at the beginning, and I wanted people to feel it. <clears throat> but is your question, why, how can I be accurate? Because no, no, you, 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 I'm not accurate, it's viewpoint. subjective, it's my yeah. take, and I'm very upfront, it's my white take on him, and he's my black friend, and that's his life. And it's his, if you like, he's used me as a platform, because he really was so angry about going to prison, about that he'd screwed up at that stage of his life, having kept out of that all his life. Um, he was very selective, really, about what he did go into and what he didn't. So, I mean, I'm aware there was quite a lot of stuff online, which I, some of which I read, some of which I didn't, because it made me a bit paranoid. Well, I came to your defence <laughs> on, uh, on the thread about the fly, because I knew it was clearly a technical thing. <laughs> God. Someone in the front here, please. Uh, and then at the back. Yes. You're next. Hi, it's a question for Leon. Leon, you were talking about um, that scene that didn't make the cut with your brother where he was talking about black people also see a particular stereotype or pander to a particular stereotype, and you left that out. Did you leave that out for genuine editorial reasons because it didn't fit your story, or was there an element of protecting your brother um, with that point and other points throughout it? Did you feel a responsibility of having to protect him and what he had to say? No, no, it wasn't, wasn't to protect him. I don't. He he's quite able to communicate himself, and I, I don't. Mainly editorial. It, it didn't it didn't really fit in, and I don't know. It, it kind of was just a spur of the moment. It's just something that popped into his head as we as we were filming, and it just contextually it didn't it didn't make sense. I, just, I didn't include it. But so he does in the trailer. He does say something like that in the in the trailer for it. I wanted to ask what all of you think constitutes authenticity in storytelling and what is an authentic voice. And I say this because I have a problem with the word authentic. I think it's a tremendously phony, patronising, judgmental word, so much so I read a book about that. And there is a presumption, if you look uh, through the, um, shed the schedule of this festival that authenticity only exists for middle class filmmakers who are usually highly educated people only exists amongst poorer or marginalized people which means that richer and less marginalized people don't get very much scrutiny i think it's a you know, it's an extraordinary omission endless films about middle class white people and stuffy old colonels and um <laughs> and I, I don't know about the word authenticity I suppose is it that you mean yes is it about honesty or is it about who has the right to tell somebody's story um you with And you're making a judgment that some sorts of people, and usually these are presumed to be poor or marginalised people, are somehow more real than middle-class educated filmmakers, let alone quiet, rich financiers. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a very good point. I because what is authentic anyway? For me, when I'm, I'm working, I'm... I'm I don't think I'm thinking of that word. I think I'm, I'm just constantly obsessing over trying to make a connection um, and, and see, how, see how it feels for me um, and, and just moving together 
as we build a relationship together and, and trying to document that, really, uh, with as much sincerity, as much honesty as I possibly can, and, 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 and with as much empathy, really, as, as possible. Um, so the authenticity of it, I don't, I don't know who decides. I, I don't know how you measure that, necessarily. I, th I think there is um, maybe also a responsibility of the audience to, to ask perhaps for more authentic films to be shown. And by you know, saying authentic, I mean, I, I spend time with a group of Roma gypsies, and when I see films about Romas, I realize that when there's a voiceover, I realize, oh my God, that's so scripted. They would not talk like that. You know, they would not say that. It's purely for the narrative's sake. So I think um, it's an important discussion to, to, to have, because... Um, because there are, there are sometimes, uh, you know, moments when, of course, each one of us has an eye as a filmmaker and a voice, and simply being true to your own eye, that means you're being authentic. Mm -hmm. um, but, when you, but there is a responsibility when you make films about others, I think. I do think so. I mean, I, I do think that people, they, they put a lot in your hands, you know, especially once you have built that relationship with someone, you know, I find anyway that you know they place so much of their trust in your hands, and then how do you hold that? How do you treat that well and with respect? Uh, I think is um, a huge responsibility that I think we all have, and I think we're all constantly making those calculations of you know what we include and what we don't include, and part of those decisions, at least for me in the past, has been about also protecting some of the people in the film. Um, and then there's been times where they don't want to be protected. And then you have to respect that. Yes. And there is a certain power, isn't it, when you point the camera Absolutely. Um, to someone. I'm confused, though, as to whether you're talking about the subject matter and who does or does not have the word authentic applied, or whether you're talking about authentic storytelling. Because obviously there's so much now constructed reality, it's really confusing to know what the truth is. I'm confused. The news looks like a pop promo. Most fiction films borrow the language of badly shot documentaries, and documentaries are looking flashier and faster. So it is a very confusing landscape, and I suppose to be pedantic, roughly speaking, I think authentic storytelling is when you really are trying, whether they're rich and white or whoever they are, you're trying, which is bloody hard to do, to make a film that is coherent, that people will watch, that genuinely captures moments of that person living their life as opposed to performing or something you think you've got to do to make it, well, to sell it to a commissioner. That's a very muddled way of saying it. But I just think, I think what you're getting at is, tr is telling vaguely truthful stories without this constant pressure to entertain or without too much of a real, factual entertainment Maybe element. Maybe less formatted. Yes. But I think that's a different discussion. Mm. Extract the authenticity out of... Well, out of whoever you're filming, and it rather parallels social scientist work, <coughs> which is over-concerned with exotic, marginalised people, and under, a social scientist work under scrutinises other sorts of people, and that's um, an omission that sh anyway, really shouldn't happen. One of the things I think is that quite a lot, people with power and people in positions of authority are really reluctant to be filmed in an honest way. So that's, and that's a battle, and I've had that a lot always. The victims of a redundancy program are very up to being filmed, but the management who are making them redundant are constantly going to say no. So they are never understood, and it's their own bloody fault. <laughs> there. I'd love to film them. The decision makers have a question over there. Okay. Hello, uh, this is a question mostly for Leon. Um, I saw your film and your brother was clearly the most distressing thing was the nurse, one particular nurse's response to him. So I wondered whether we're talking about ongoing relationships and the audience responsibility if uh, your film is going to be shown at that hospital or to people who work in the NHS to give them a sense of one boy's 
authentic voice. I hadn't thought about that actually. Mm. What's the word? Be brilliant. Mm. Are you asking? Is it going to be shown or? Uh, well, it's an idea now. I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. discussion is to show it you know maybe not pick on that nurse although I was wondering whether your brother had confronted that person but to take well, it was it, more than one of them it was yeah, se several that yeah, said so that. to take it to that hospital initially and think about right so the audience here you know great and I liked your film I loved your film but I <laughs> the message needs to get to the people who are upsetting you know men like your brother really maybe there's a quiet uh, Financier somewhere <laughs> can help me do that. <laughs> or get them to broadcast it and have a discussion afterwards with people from the NHS. I think they need to do more transmission of things and build conversations around them. Because I thought that was really important, what you said earlier about you don't see yourself. Yeah, um... I just had a question really for Leon. Um, I suppose sort of sitting here, I feel really touched by what you're saying. But, you know, I grew up in southeast London and it starts making me think about the pipeline after the film. You know, like what you have in your mind as to what this film can achieve in terms of changing things. Because sometimes it feels like, especially, what, you know, we're talking about documentaries being borrowed by lots of different mediums. And it also sometimes sort of becomes like entertainment and we, we go to things and we experience something intensely for two hours and then we leave the cinema or the screen. What changes after that? And I'm just sort of interested in, in your minds, how does that manifest itself, propel you through, you know, keep you wanting to tell that story, not just for the story's sake, but for change or to make something different happen afterwards? Um. I don't think wanting even really, really comes into it. I feel like I have to, because I've, I've got that stereotyping. I mean, you know, that, that was me at one point, and I would have hoped it would have changed before my brother reached this age, and I remember having conversations with him as he was going from being a young, young boy to becoming a young man to, to prepare him almost for being stopped by police and things like that. And that's, that's heartbreaking to feel that you have to do that. And now the focus is on my children. I don't want them to grow up and have to face this sort of thing as the standard for their lives, just for being looking the way they look. So you know, our lives are almost completely dictated by the colour of our skin. So before you, you recognise our characters and judge us on our character... You look at, you, you know, I'm not, I'm not just a man, I'm a black man. So I want to get to the point where he can just, everybody can just be a man or woman. Because right now, when, when you think about default human, default human is like a white man. And it shouldn't be the case. Which, you know, it's not, it's not to take it, it's not, there's nothing wrong. I had, I had, um, Someone else who'd watch my film say it made the, it was a lady made her feel ashamed of being white, and I don't that that's not correct either. That that doesn't help anyone. No one should feel ashamed of who they are, but we should all be allowed to just be who we are without being judged. And if we're, we're being packaged, you know, we're being packaged. And the reason it's called that is called that's not ours because it's talking about a stereotype that we didn't even create. So we're saying that that's not ours. We we didn't we didn't create that, but we're still subject to it. So, to con I mean, one way it continues is for people like yourself or this uh, lady over here. If you go and you talk about it, and I would hope that it, it, a lot of dialogue comes from this film. And it might be slow and small at first, but it's better that it's happening than it's not happening at all. Can I just add something to what you just asked? I, I think it's also interesting that, you know, being filmmakers of colour, there's also a kind of added responsibility or expectation sometimes that you are a filmmaker and you are also an activist. You know, so you are kind of responsible to, to kind of 
to, to think about what kind of change can you create and, and actively use your film to do that in some sort of way. And I don't find that that a lot of white filmmakers necessarily are expected to, to campaign and be activists in the same right. I personally don't mind because I am an activist and, and, and my filmmaking very much is, is a part of my instrument in, in achieving that. Um, but I do think it's interesting because I, I have also met a lot of other you know, filmmakers of color who would just like to make films and who would just like to have the opportunity and the finances to be able to, to tell the stories that they want to tell without f having the, the responsibility to change the world and, and, and to, to have to carry that burden of, of it has to say this or it has to say that, it has to impact society this or, in this or that way. I think our situation is a bit different because we are actively actually doing that. Um, and, and our filmmaking purpose is that. So I think it's, it's a thing to kind of think about as well. We have time for one last question, if anyone has like, yeah. or, or any final comments from, uh, from the panel. I was just going to say in the 80s, I was at the National Film School, and I was expected to make films about women at the time. The National mm. Film School was full of furious women, which made me want to just <laughs> aggressively... I've filmed men all my life. I think for 35 <laughs> years I've made one film about women, and it was Jerry Halliwell. <laughs> but I always... I th and I think deep down, yeah. I thought, I don't want to be part of it, I don't yeah. want to be stereotyped yeah. as that, yeah. um, so I'm going to do blokes. Yeah. And then I got yeah. stuck. No, it's very important because you do feel cornered. You feel like you're, you, you're only entitled to tell certain stories. You, you can only uh, be a part of a certain jurisdiction, and that's it. You don't get to step outside of that, and, and, and yeah, that's so Leon, frustrating. When I hear Leon talk, I just think Leon should and has to make the film. You have to, from your perspective. Yeah, I agree. Because I think you're absolutely right. No, because everybody's sitting around discussing young black men and knife crime, yeah. and they're all old white women with grey cropped hair. It's bizarre. <laughs> and I just think that you've got... That was so powerful, that moment, your brother's face mm. in the barber shop. Mm. Why didn't you show the barber's face? Because I wanted to focus on... I'm not saying on, you should have done, but, but I'm I wanted to focus on, on my brother and his reactions and... Was that the <laughs> no, <laughs> get out of here. No, but his expression is so. The, some of the things he's hearing. I mean, for one, when when Stuart starts talking about the the incident with the policeman, that was I I, I told him to tell him that story, and I wanted to yeah. focus on my brother's face hearing these things and the kind of therapy of the haircut as well. Mm -hmm. It feels quite nice actually. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, two more questions. So you're next. Sorry, yeah. I just wanted to go back to the point that was raised at the back of the room. It was rather a dissonant point. Um, and in a way, it was criticising the premise of the session, which is about the extractive versus the authentic. And just to come back to the issue of power, really, because this seems to me to be the, one of the fundamental problems that filmmakers face, that the powerful do not wish to be represented. And power is extremely difficult to represent. And that is a really important issue yeah. to address. Yeah. I don't know if people know, for example the wonderful Michael Grigsby film called Living on the Edge, which is about Britain in the late Thatcher period. And it's about poverty, but it's also about power. And the film Trial, which is on at the festival, about, the, um, uh, about Dilma Rousseff, the, the president of Brazil, being kicked out of her job, although it only films with the party which supports her, actually you get a very strong sense of what the party <laughs> that's getting rid of her is doing. Um, so, uh, forgive me, I, I know that's, it's wrong to even talk about this because it's not the agenda of the session, but I still think the issue of power is a really, really important question for all filmmakers. Yeah. How do you find ways? How do you find ways of hinting at and, if possible, representing where the power lies? And one of the problems with access to power now is the enormous amount of PR in every corporation and every government body. There are people who are, well, you know, they're all paid vast amounts of money to help you lie, and you're allowed an interview but not to follow and not to observe. I think it's a massive and important issue. Yes, and I, I think it's often left to investigative journalists or, or news, and I think in documentary filmmaking, you're right, it's not often uh, addressed. I, I agree. Okay, I think that's, that's it for today. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you.